Gary Quinn, and welcome to another episode of Ready, Set, Live. My conversation today is about really transforming fear into love. My guest is someone who has had a near-death experience. She is really out there speaking about changing the lives of people. She has a number one, she had, has three books. She's the number one uh, author, New York Times author, and she's a beautiful woman. And welcome to the show, Anita Morjani. Wow, thank you so much for that introduction, Gary. It is such a pleasure and honor to be here. And it's, thanks it's, for having it's, me on. It's a, it's a quest, I believe, of, of love connects the world. And, you know, I think when, when other speakers and teachers and people who have experienced um, some, let's say, epiphany, uh, it's something that really needs to be shared. And I know that you um, actually had a near-death experience, but you were diagnosed with cancer. Talk to me about that. What was that like when you got that diagnosis? And tell our listeners and audience what, what, what happened. So um, I was diagnosed in 2002 with, a, uh, with lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had a lump on my neck and I had it checked out and the doctor biopsied it and he confirmed it was lymphoma. And then when they did scans, they said it was at stage two, which means it had spread to a quarter, like one quadrant of my body. But over a period of four years, it continued to spread, even though I tried many forms of treatment and ways to treat it. It would, it would subside for a while and then it would come back. It would subside and it would come back. And so by the end of 2005 and in, in early 2006, it had progressed to the point where it had spread and metastasized throughout my entire lymphatic system. So I had tumors the size of golf balls from the base of my skull back here all around my neck, under my arm, in my armpits, in my chest, and all the way down to my abdomen. And by that point, my body had stopped absorbing nutrition. So, um, um, and because it had stopped absorbing nutrition, I was dropping weight like crazy. I had no appetite to eat. I just could not keep food down. And I weighed 85 pounds. I looked like a skeleton. My lungs were filled with fluid. And so when I would lie flat, I would choke on my own fluid. So I couldn't even lie flat. My muscles completely atrophied because there was no nutrition. And so um, I couldn't even walk. I was either sitting or lying. And I was in so much pain and so much discomfort and so much fear that it was miserable. I feared the disease. I feared death. I feared the treatments. I, I, it was just probably something. It was the worst nightmare anyone could possibly live through. And I wouldn't wish it upon anyone, not even my worst enemy. During that uh, time, Anita, was there a fear that you basically thought, I know you had been diagnosed and you went back to India to, uh, you were living in Hong Kong and you yes. went back to India and really started doing everything from Ayurvedic to healing, yoga. Were you really terrified or did you think you were going to get to the other side? I, I actually had a lot of hope that I was going to make it through, especially when I went to do the Ayurveda and I did try traditional Chinese medicine. So I want to actually, in fact, I'm glad you asked that. So let me, um, let me explain a little bit about what was happening there. Um, I had a tremendous fear of cancer. I had watched two people die of cancer and both of these people had, um, uh, they, they went to the absolute top cancer hospitals in the world had the best cancer treatments that money can possibly buy and they still died so when i was dealing with my own diagnosis my mind thought it was a death sentence and i feared um and i feared um, conventional cancer treatments 
So even having that put into my body made me think that this treatment, the radi radiation, the chemotherapy is going to kill me. Um, and so I opted for alternative therapies. So this is, so I, I really want to explain this quite clearly. So I went to India and I removed myself from this um, paradigm, from this environment that I was in. I was in an environment that was toxic in the sense that um, there was a lot of focus on cancer in the environment that I was in. A lot of focus because my best friend was going through it. My brother-in-law was going through it. And all everybody was talking about was cancer therapies. And yet I was watching them deteriorate no matter what they were doing. And now I was facing the same fate, at least in my head. And I made a determined effort not, I was determined not to go down the same road that they were going down. And when I would say to everybody around me that I am going to India, I am going to do Ayurveda, people would say, you're crazy. Um, that's dumb. Cancer is serious. Don't be so woo woo. The, those alternatives aren't proven. And, and so people would say this to me all the time. And I would say, no, but it doesn't look like it's working on, you know, like what you guys are saying is proven. It doesn't look like it's working on these guys. They're still dying. So I removed myself from that environment, which looking back now to me is a very toxic environment because I was filled with fear of cancer and the treatment of cancer and fear of death. And I went to a different environment where people viewed illnesses differently. So I followed a Ayurvedic teacher and a yoga master, and they believed that every illness in the body is a cause of imbalance. So they said, we're going to work with you to bring your body back to balance, remove the label cancer. That label is very fear-based. And I loved that. I, was, it, I took to it like a fish to water. I was there for six months. And my body started feeling so much better. I could feel the tumors were visibly shrinking. They were visibly. In the meantime, the other two people I knew were still continuing to have their treatments and continuing to deteriorate. And one of them, my brother-in-law, passed away. Um, and I was having going through this treatment and I was actually getting better and feeling better. And I felt better because I was in an environment that wasn't using fear. It wasn't saying that this was a death sentence. It was in an environment where they didn't even use the word cancer. Everything was just an imbalance in the body. They had a different way, a different type of metric to measure health in the body. It wasn't a measurement of cancer cells or tumors. It was a very different metric. It was more about about cleansing your body of toxins. And it was also about mind balance and emotions. And so I did the whole thing and I was so happy there doing that. After wow. about six months, I felt pretty confident that I could continue doing this. I was missing my home. I was missing my dog. I was missing my husband who was visiting like every, he visited twice during the six months, but because of his work, he couldn't come and stay there with me. So I was missing them and I thought, okay, now I can continue this. I know what to do. I can continue this. I'm going to go home. I felt so much better. Um, and so I, I went home. And as soon as I went home, now my husband is extremely supportive. Danny, many, uh, most people who know me know him. He's extremely supportive and was so happy and, and was even happy for me to continue doing it. But I was uh, you know, he was happy for me to continue staying on there if that was what worked for me and he would continue coming out to visit me. But I wanted to come home. As soon as I came home, I saw that my best friend had deteriorated even further. And I was kind of shocked to see her. But at the same time, the mixed message I was getting was people were asking me, what did you do? What have you been doing for six months? And when I said, I was doing Ayurveda, I was following a yoga teacher, I've been doing cleanses, I've been uh, meditating, I've been connecting with my higher self, I have, you know, blah, 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 I was saying all this. And then they were saying, 
Yes, but have you actually gone to see a medical doctor? Have you had the scans? Have you had the MRI to prove that you're okay? And I said, no, I didn't need it. I could feel it. Everything was getting better. And they were saying, no, you know, this is a deadly disease. And so all that toxic, those beliefs, those fears started to come back. And every day that I was continuing to follow my regime, my mind was going to, oh my God, what if it isn't true? What if I really still have it in my body? What if it's still growing? And every little pain I would feel, it was, I was still thinking, that, oh my gosh, what if they're right? What if they're right? And I got so scared, I started to feel it coming back. And so when I, you know, and so I was too scared to go for the scans because I thought, oh gosh, what if they reveal something? I know if I had continued to stay in that environment, I would have been fine. And yet, and then my best friend passed away and um, I was devastated, shocked, kind of, broken and and uh, scared and I went to see the doctor and sure enough it had come back and uh, and and so hence a lot of my story today and what I share with people is I tell them that it is that fear it's that toxic environment that can really affect your body particularly if you are an empath and someone who is highly suggestible and and it's so interesting Anita because uh, many years ago, I spent some time with his, uh, the, his Holiness Dalai Lama and his brother, and he was talking about people who have illness. When you make friends with your illness, you are starting to heal. So basically, you were healing, making friends with that illness, but saying, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm taking dominion, and I'm going to be my own health advocate and change this. And I think so many people in the world today you know, they hear a doctor who gives them a death sentence, and it's really our bodies being out of alignment, uh, especially when you were uh, healing and you were starting to shift. Were there epiphanies of, of energy or information that you were downloading? Because I know you transformed fear into love. Yes, so there were a lot of epiphanies during those six months. But what I realized was that when I was back in this old environment, I started to doubt them. And so this is why what happened is that when I literally died and I was in that near death state, death actually showed me that all those epiphanies I was having was true. It was real. And it showed me that my connection to my inner world, my higher world was actually so much more um, real or true for me than the information I was getting from the physical outside world, which was the information coming from the fear mongers and the medical establishment and so on. That was actually part of the problem. The solutions were coming from up there. Right. The, so, the near so death the, experience. So the trigger, what triggered you into the coma or was that when you had the near death experience? How did it how did it how did it happen okay so then um so as so as i said after i came back from india um and i was in fantastic health for for like quite a few months until the fear started to get to me and the people saying oh you know you haven't actually been to a doctor and blah 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 and 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 everything and so that's when i started to deteriorate my friend died and so on um so my health continued to deteriorate to the point that I spoke about earlier, where it was where um, I was no longer absorbing any nutrition and I was in so much fear and pain and I lost so much weight that I was a skeleton. My lungs were filled with fluid. I would choke on my own fluid when I would lie down. And then on February the 1st, 2006, my organs started to shut down. I, and I was, I was taken to the hospital. My organs started to shut down. I was in the intensive care unit. I went into a coma and the doctors basically told my family, this was it. I wasn't even gonna make it through the night. They said that my organs are now shutting down one by one. And I was finally in the dying process 
and I wasn't coming back. And so I was plugged into all these different tubes, heart monitor and whatever, and, 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 uh, oxygen and everything and, uh, nutrition, just tons of tubes. But when I was in that coma, so basically my family were around me and they thought I was dying. And when, but when I was in that coma, I left my body. And when I left my body, I was able to see and hear and feel everything that was happening all around. But it wasn't like seeing with physical eyes or hearing with physical ears. It was much more of an encompassing peripheral experience um, where I was just aware of everything that was happening. And it was like I could feel the emotions of the people around me, the resignation of the doctors, my family who were distraught, but I felt incredible. The fear was gone. The pain was gone. I was now free. I was completely free of all of that. And I felt like I was enveloped by this feeling of just pure, unconditional love. And it was, it was nothing like I'd ever experienced in physical life before. Because in, during my lifetime, I'd always felt that I had to work at being loved. And I, had, I always felt that I had to be deserving or worthy. I had to work at being deserving or worthy of receiving love. But here in this state, in the state of death, I felt I was loved just because I was existed. It almost felt like I was being congratulated for having gone through this challenge that is physical life. It was like I was being welcomed home and rejoiced and there was no judgment and no punishment and nothing. And, and I was surrounded by these beings and I didn't recognize all of them. I recognized some, one of them was my best friend who had passed, who had just passed away from cancer two years prior. Another one was my dad who'd passed away 10 years ago, but, um, I didn't recognize all the beings around me from this lifetime, but it was like they were welcoming me and they just loved me so unconditionally. Um, and then, and, and a lot happened there, uh, on that side, like the clarity, I understood why I had got the cancer. I understood how I had always suppressed myself and been a people pleaser. I understood how I had fallen into the fear of this, of the, fear um, based information that is always fed to me on this physical realm, the, you know, whether it's fear of being disliked, fear of disappointing people, um, fear of not being good enough, fear of cancer, fear of not following authorities, fear of not listening to the doctors, all these fears had driven my life. And when I was on this side, I realized I am connected to the universe or source or whatever we want to call it. We are all connected and we forget to listen. All I needed to do was listen to that. I had been listening to that during that time I was in India and I had started healing, but I had, I had forgotten to listen when I went back to my old environment. And so th there was like just so much clarity. And then I was given a choice as to whether I want to come back into this physical life or stay there. No part of me wanted to come back because it was so beautiful there. But and you came back for Danny. Yes, <laughs> I did. I did because I realized our purposes were linked. And also I realized that now that I understood who we are and that we are connected and I understood what caused the disease, that if I chose to come back, my body would heal very, very quickly. And so I did make the decision to come back and sign here. And, and that was the inspired the, your first book, which was called Dying to Be Me, is yes. this story, which became a number one success, New York Times bestselling book, over 45 million copies sold and published in 45 languages. I mean, that's your story. And your second book came out, but your third book which just came out is Sensitive is the New Strong, which there it is, yes, and we'll hold it up here in the studio. Um, talk to me about, uh, you know, that being a sensitive, you know, people who are intuitive or sensitive, they're more apt, and I know that I'm very um, aware when I walk in a room and I feel things, uh, 
you know, since I was a little boy, I, I had this gift and I shut it down for a while because I didn't know what it was. And I think everybody has the intuitive side, but this book talks about really, um, you know, what inspires us, but, but why do we suppress these feelings or this intuition? Um, what, 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 what is the book really inspired you to write the, the, the third book? So um, what inspired me to write the third book is that I realized um, over the last, I don't know, five, six years that I am an empath. And I started to understand that not everybody in our, is an empath. And so I started to realize, and so I started to research, like, what is it that's different about empaths? Now, one of the things that I say is that on the one hand, I tend not to use labels, but yet I'm happy to use the label of being an empath because I don't see that as an, a label. So I just want to clarify to me, because people say to me, oh, you say you don't use labels and yet you, you, you're kind of saying you're an empath and they're empaths. The reason I do this is because, is because what I call a label, a label is something that restricts you. A label is something that boxes you in and prevents you from being who you truly are because you're limited. So a label limits you. Whereas calling myself an empath is a description. It's not a label. So when I realized I was an empath, it set me free because it gave me, it gave me a way to understand myself, which allowed me even more freedom to work with who I am in order to be myself fully. So when something sets you free, it's not a label, it's a description. When something limits you, then it's a label. So I just wanted to say that. So now what I realized and what I learned from two prominent authors and psychologists is one of them is Dr. Elaine Aaron and the other one is Dr. Judith Orlov. They discovered that, that, um, that there are people who are highly sensitive and so they coined the term empath and the difference between an empath and just a sensitive person is that an empath actually feels the emotions of the people around them. A sensitive person is aware of the emotions of the people around them. And someone who's not even sensitive is not even aware of the emotions of the people around them. So it's like a spect spectrum. So you have people who are not really aware of the, what's going on around them. They're not as aware of how other people are feeling or their emotions or how they get affected by events. Then there are the people who are sensitive. And of course, there's degrees of all of this. Sensitive people who are really aware of what everyone is feeling. And, they, um, and so they know what people need. And so they make very good nurses and caregivers and health caregivers and healers. But then there are highly sensitive people, which have now been called empaths, where they not only know what other people are feeling and even can feel it, but they absorb it into their own energy. So that's the difference between an empath and just a sensitive or highly sensitive person. An empath literally is a sponge. And then the empath cannot separate their own energy from other people's energy. They cannot tell that this is not mine. I picked it up from being around that person. And so what ends up happening with an empath is that they need other people around them to feel good in order for them to feel good themselves. Because if I'm absorbing your energy and you don't feel good, that means I'm not going to feel good because I'm absorbing your energy because I'm like a sponge. I'm an empath. So what ends up happening is they end up being people pleasers. They go out of their way, making everybody around them feel good. And they do it instinctively without thinking it's their nature because somehow instinctively their nature has no knows that that person needs to feel good for me to feel good. And so you spend your life wearing yourself down, trying to make everybody around you feel good and you take on that responsibility. And so what happens is that it doesn't quite work out that, okay, you've made these people feel good. It's all good now. Now you feel good. No, what happens is you start to train the people around you that this is what you do for them. 
And so you end up attracting people who only come to you because you are a good shoulder to cry on. And so you find yourself surrounded by people all the time who need help. And so many empaths find that they don't get a break because they don't realize this is what they do. They do it so unconsciously. Um, they don't realize they are an empath. They just know that they are good listeners. They're a good shoulder to cry on. And these are good traits to have. These are great traits to have. But the worst thing is that if you are so worn down and so run down by it, and because you've absorbed everyone else's energy, that in the end you get sick. Mm -hmm. And so basically the driving force behind this book is to teach empaths that this is what you have a tendency to do, but don't lose hope. First, you have to accept and be aware that you have a tendency to do this. So only, uh, so this is only for the people who know, as I am speaking this, if you know that you have a tendency to do this, then you are the person that my message is aimed for and my book is aimed for. Um, and, and if you have, it's, and what I want you to know is once you identify and realize that you have a tendency to do this, that's the first step to healing that and becoming a much more empowered empath. And then the other steps are realizing that in actuality, being an empath is a gift. And in my book and in my videos and speeches and whatever I do now, I teach you how to hone those gifts and how to focus on the gifts. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the driving. Force. Knowing what you know now, Anita, with all of these experiences that you've been through, what does love mean to you today? Wow, that's a beautiful question and a, and a big word. Knowing what I know today, love has to start with self-love, particularly, particularly if you are an empath. If you are an empath, different rules apply. If you identify to what I was saying, different rules apply. And I'm not saying you're better or more special than anyone else. It's just like if you say somebody has Asperger's or something, they have a different way of being and thinking. If you are an empath, you need to start with self-love first and foremost. Because empaths um, are not good at receiving. They are not, uh, they are good at really good at giving and giving and not good at receiving. Empaths struggle with loving themselves. Love starts with self love. If I had known this before, uh, I would not have had cancer. I would not have died. I don't regret anything because I love what happened to me and I love where I am now and what I'm doing today. And it couldn't have happened if it didn't happen. But when you love yourself, when you truly love yourself, what happens is that you allow your soul, your higher self, source energy to be express its, to express itself through you. When you don't love yourself, you deny source from expressing itself through you. Um, so loving yourself is super important. And when you love yourself, what happens is that you end up having enough love to share and love everyone else. An empath by their nature gives and loves other people. But when they love themselves, they have so much more to give. So I love this story, Anita, when you were a little girl and your mom used to put the cookies in your lunch and those bullies at your school used to take them away. And then you started having your mom put cookies for them. And then they started liking you. But you say, you talk about the woo-wee principle. What, what is the woo-wee principle? So the woo-wee principle is actually the act of doing without doing. It's, it's the act of turning things around so um, I'll give you another example. Many of you know about Ho'oponopono. That is a Wu Wei principle. Um, and the way that works is that our, our conventional, our traditional way of, let's say, punishing people is taking revenge or, um, you know, or, or let's say imprisoning them. Now, I'm not saying we don't need a legal system and a prison system for people who are dangerous. But here's the thing, here's the Wu Wei thing. Um, even when you put people away, the Wu Wei thing is then giving them love, not hatred. It's not about putting them somewhere 
where they are going to be faced with more crime and hatred, which is what happens in our prisons. Our prisons, so a Wu Wei principle would have a very different type of a prison system where you would take these people away from society so that society is still safe, but where you take them to is not a place filled with hatred and crime. It would be a place filled with love because the reason these people are the way they are is because they don't know what love is. They haven't experienced it before. So when I did that with the bullies, what I did was I showed them love. My mom taught me how to show them love and give them what they wanted without having to fight for it. Um, so Wu Wei is about turning things around. So most people think, oh, this has happened, so I have to go and do this. Sometimes the best thing is to step back and not take action, but just to share love. Another example of a Wu Wei principle is when I tell people that you don't have to go out and show and teach people. You just have to love yourself, increase your own energy, and just be a presence, just be who you are. And your very presence will uplift people even without you saying a word. That's Wu Wei. Wow. Wu Wei is being the change as opposed to going out and taking action. Wow, wonderful. Wu Wei is also about um, you know, showing people how to do things instead of getting angry at what you don't like in the world. And so instead of getting angry at what we don't like, let's be what we do like and show people how to do it. Wow, wonderful. Last question, Anita. When you leave this experience, how do you want to be remembered in this lifetime? Wow. Um, I want to leave the world a better place than, um, than it was when I came here. I would love to leave for people a different um, medical or health paradigm. I would love for us to shift the, the, my biggest dream would be if I could leave the message that we need to shift from an illness-based medical paradigm to a wellness-focused medical paradigm and to shift from a fear of illness to a joy of wellness. We need to focus on wellness and what it means to be well and healthy. We need to find joy in our lives and find joy in taking responsibility for our wellness and our health instead of constantly being in fear of illness. If we can make that shift, if I can help in some way to make that shift, that is something I would love to leave behind. That is something I feel so strongly about and it is what I believe is the reason why so many people are sick today. Wow, thank you so much for spending this time with me, my dear fellow Pisces sister. I, I bless you. I'm so honored that you spent this time with me, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much, Gary. It's been a, such a pleasure. I loved your questions. Thank you. I'm Gary Quinn. Join me for another episode of Ready, Set, Live.